want to put up our next presenter. Amen. We thank God for, amen, Superintendent Andrew Papina. Amen. And we're looking forward to um, his class on financial literacy in the church. Amen. It's going to be another great session. So let's offer him, amen, the hand praise as he comes, amen, in his own way. Let's say amen for a few minutes. Thank you, Pastor. Did we enjoy Dr. Fisher? Yes. Amen. We thank God for, our, of course, uh, God, and we give an honor to Bishop Brandon B. Porter, our prelate, and uh, the fra fragrance of this house, and also our supervisor, my lovely wife, Shirley Perpiner. How many how many of y'all know how, how much your budget is for your church? How many of you know what your annual budget is for your church? Your annual budget. Now, I see some pastors don't have their hands up. We're going to talk about this. <laughs> Amen. Listen, uh, the Lord told Peter upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so he was talking to Peter, uh, not about Peter as Petros, but he was talking about uh, how stable uh, the church would be. When we talk, let me say the church. Uh, uh, when we talk about church, we're talking about the ecclesia. We're talking about the body of Christ. We're talking about a lot of people. Amen. And so I love what Bishop Fisher was talking about as it relates to vision, vision, vision. Of course, Habakkuk uh, talks about write the vision uh, on tables. Make it what? Plain. Make it plain that he who reads it can run. And the visionary just needs to be writing. And so when it comes to Dealing with all of this, and it, it, it seems like hyperbole. It seems like something very abstract, right? Uh, we talk about power, the Holy Ghost power. The Holy Ghost will come and give us power. But what is that power? Right. The, the details of that power. How do we get that power? How do you know when you have it? And if you begin to delve into that power, it really talk, it's really dealing with a skill set right. on how to do the work. And so when we're talking about the work of the church, let me say the work of the church. When, when we're dealing with our, God gave me this, this uh, teaching regarding the whole thing, leadership, administration, and all of that. And so when we look at the house, let's look at God's house. Uh, and I'm going to be kind of very abstract today because I don't want this aware of how important it is as it relates to uh, the finances of our church. Of course, we know how important the tithe are, right? Yeah. Bring the tithe into the storehouse that there will be. But there's another thing that the principle of tithe, the, the unity, where there's unity, there is strength, right? So the principle of tithing. And so what we have to do, I tell, I tell my people sometimes, we as African Americans, we have to get saved twice. We have to get saved because of uh, the devil attacking us. And then we have to get saved from us attacking us. Because of that, you know that thing that was put in us that we have a hard time bringing our um, our sources, our resources together, our monies, our times, and our talents, when we can get that together. So when we look at the house, we have uh, the pastor. Uh, we look at the pastor as the rafters. He's the covering. And then the pastoral care, the shingles, right? The shingles are over helping the pastor and covering the pastor. The leaders over there, the leaders are, in my opinion, the walls of the house. They, they holding up the arms of the leader. And then you got the preaching and the teaching. Preaching and the teaching is the foundation of the house. Amen. Help me say, build God's house. Yeah. So when we begin to deal with the call, the stewardship, of course, at the top, the vision comes from who? God. The, the vision comes from God. The stewardship is the at 
atmosphere over the house. Amen. So we have to make sure that we all understand we are stewards and we're supposed to have good stewardship as it relates to God's house. And don't just look at this as a tangible house. We're still talking about the church. We still got talking about taking care of the widows and the orphans and those that uh, need and all of that. Oh, guess, guess what? All of this has financial implications. All of it does. So here, so the, uh, administration, uh, let administration be the doors. Every house has a door. Every house has that opening. And so we have the stewardship, the pastor, the call. The call is, if you can see it, is actually the architectural rendering, right. the plans, the plans of your house. So when we begin to, de if, if you are a builder, when you look at this room right here, you see more than white walls. If you are a contractor, you see more than uh, the floor. You see behind the walls. You see the wiring. You see the ports. You see behind that. So when it comes to finance, when it comes to uh, that as it relates to anything operational, you're actually, finance is going to help you see beyond what, Everybody else just see, they say, oh, look at the beautiful pews. But uh, if you're a part of that financial planning, you know how much those pews cost, where they came from, how much it costs to ship them there. And, 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 it, and when you know things like this is for a stewardship, there's a value placed on uh, how you take care of it, right. how you take care of God's house. So building God's house, financial literacy means it's critical thinking skills regarding Finances. This is enhancing and sharpening. So Matthew 16 and 18 says that, that upon this rock I'll build my church. Him say firm foundation. A firm foundation. When you begin to think about uh, you, God's church, the house that you go to, that you pray in, that is should be a subset or a model or an example of what your local house should look like. That all of us, when we come together, 10%, all of us come together and, and bring our resources together, the best of everything should be in that house. If you look at Mason Temple, they built Mason Temple a long time ago after it, built, after it burned down. I spent 20 years at Mason Temple. And every day, and as I went through it, the locks on the doors are not a uh, builder grade. The locks on the doors. The, I mean, the, the stuff, may, do you know Mason Temple will not burn down? The only thing we're burning Mason Temple now is what we put in it a few years ago. Everything, metal frames in the windows, concrete, everything, because the first one burned down. So when it comes to stewardship, you, you don't just run to Home Depot and buy stuff to put in your church. Like it's your rental property. Stop it. All right. All right, I'm back. All right, all right. So let, 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 let me, is this all right? So let's, let's, let's get down to this. Um, as we deal with this global economy, um, Dr. Fisher talked about being able to change, being able to pivot you got to understand that things are changing and they are changing at breakneck speed right now. Since COVID-19, it's, it's some pastors that said before COVID-19, I will never get on in them Twitters. I will never do any of that. Bite and start binding the devil. <coughs> binding the devil because it, it, we just don't know. But hear me say power. Power gives you that skill set on how to live. So here, here we go. The, this presentation, as I said, is going to do these things, but I want y'all to repeat this for me. Uh, understanding, understanding finance allows me to translate vision into financial strategy. Got it. We have, we have the haves and the have-nots, right? Some people know and some don't know, but we all need to at least be aware. Good question. Now, now here's the thing. 
we living in the, we're living in this season of mega churches. There are more people in smaller churches together than it is in the mega church. But here's the thing: because of uh, the virtual platform and all of that, the small churches are now quickly becoming the new mega churches. Amen. It's not about these walls. You can stay in this room right here. This room here maybe seat what 250 people, but you can talk to thousands of people spiritualize it that should I do this or not because what a lot of times what we do we're we're overcompensating or undercompensating because help does not look like you think like you talk I don't need 10 of me I need somebody that does amen the God that I serve but I don't need them to operate like me is around $168,000 annually Annually, that's normal. That's normal. That's what what's saying. Uh, there is unity. There is strength. Now we we come together. We don't want to miss this point. We come. What I'm going to talk about is dealing with. If I get to that, the banking piece of it. Just think of it. What would it look like if where the unity that it took to tithe. You took that same unity, I'm just talking about strategy now, and put your money in the same bank. I'm talking about your personal money. Everybody in that church banked at the same bank. So you're letting us know that you can do it, that you do understand that unity is powerful, unity that collaborates. Amen. Because somewhere in the back of our mind, I don't know where it is, somewhere way back in the back of our mind, there are some, amen? They would say, save me, Lord. Lord. Uh Uh-huh. So here's the thing, qualify. They got the what? They know accounting, finance, bookkeeping, and they can cipher like Jethro does not mean that they can be on your finance team. Look at the windows. Illuminate the building with rays of the past. The windows, right? Amen. You want the big windows. You want the nice windows. You want the Anderson windows. But guess that a church is uh, really be open to the public. Did you know that? I know it's your church. But it's really not your church. Y'all quiet. You, you know, if, if, if a member says, y'all, anybody out there? Okay. If a member says, Pastor, uh, what's our budget? Listen, what that knock on, I'd rather for my member to knock on my door right. than that IRS to knock on my door. Warning before for growth and the progressive seasons which come when God blesses his children. And now the pastor is scratching their head trying to figure out who do I trust to do what they were doing. Don't you know you can't find that person? That person does not exist. God is gracious. He's gracious. And he he gave you that to get you started, to get you going and all of that. But in the meantime, what you have to do is begin to, in this qualification uh, have a system in place where you can trust the system beyond trusting people. Wow. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Let me say trust the system. Yeah. See, when you don't have a system, when you don't have a system, it'll make your hair turn almost like mine. Yeah. Amen. You, you got to have, because what's happening is all while those faithful people were there, you were growing. Now you're bigger than ever before God has opened up the, the foundation and, and opened up the way. And now the people that were supporting you, the, the legs under the table, are gone. But you were not preparing uh, God's church for the future. Amen. So you got to, you got, first of all, expect to grow. God will answer prayer. He's going to answer your prayer. He's, going to, he's, he's, he's not slack concerning his promises. You will grow. But you got to be uh, disciplined in how you go about this. So uh, as we deal with the finance team, select tithers. Financial experience. 
They need to have financial experience that is comparable to your church's vision. Y'all hear me? You might not need a CPA. You might need a, a good bookkeeper. You, you know, but get you. That's why every church is the reason there are churches on every corner. A lot of times God knows what to do, where and when. Every church has a culture. It has a climate. It has a personality. And somebody, nobody has no leader. I don't care how anointed they are. They, no leader has global appeal. No, somebody is coming to your church. And when they come, they want to see structure. They want to see strategy. They want to see, they want to be able to look beyond the walls and see where do they fit. I'm a two by four. Where do I fit? I'm hardwood floors. I'm carpet. I'm, I'm, I'm a big screen. Where do I fit? The only way I'll know that is that you make the vision plain. So God can show me uh-huh. where I fit. Yeah. Okay? Okay, so we have qualifications. Then the next thing is financial integrity. Financial integrity. Go to accounting system there. Uh, uh, when we begin to deal with financial integrity, this is another component of anyone dealing with your church's finance. Financial integrity. Every building should have functioning, clean windows in it. You cannot afford not to have an accountant and or a bookkeeper in your facility or that's connected. It could be a contracted person that does it just annually. But you need to have somebody that's uh, uh, dealing with your accounting system every every week. Every week. Don't you know your money look like mine after about a week? <laughs> they got the same color, got green, got the same presidents on it, and all that. You get, you cannot allow money to get cold. Right. Amen. You got to do it right then. Talking about, um, and, and, okay. <laughs> don't ever accept money from people that don't have time for you to count it over. Right. You don't want me to say it again. Okay, I just got the money out of Sunday school class, and I run back to the office, and, and I drop it in, and I give it to uh, Dr. Kenan, and he said, well, wait, Pamina, we got to count this money. And I'm like, no, you're going to count it, it uh, whatever it is, because they called it me. Uh-uh, if you don't have time to handle business, don't handle business then. Amen? Amen. Just, just. Everybody can't listen. I've been I've been, I've been doing this for a, a whole lot of years, and I can tell when people don't have the spirit to handle money. You, you can tell, can't you? They 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 they, they, they just you know if if I have the correct spirit of handling money, I want to the transition has to be right. Amen. When I give you. When I give you the baton, I want to make sure it's in your hand b- before we drop it. Because if you drop it, we lose the race. Right? But when that, that individual spirit shows up, amen, go on, whatever it is. Listen, it doesn't work like that. I, I've, I've been through so. Oh, anyway, let's move on. Help me say financial integrity. To consider how a church handles its money, the process, financial integrity, and to consider who handles the money, the personnel. The person that the process is important and the personnel, those two are important. Those who lead in church financial matters should be experienced in financial matters, and they should also be acquainted with the spiritual dynamics of the church. You got to be acquainted with the spiritual dynamic. What do you mean, Pastor? Uh, when you're dealing in, we might be able to get to the budget piece. Uh, when you're talking about, you cannot, when you're dealing with God's house, you cannot deduce mo- uh, the work of the Lord into cold, hard money. Money 
follows ministry. The work of the Lord, then the money. Amen. Count up the cost. Measure twice. Cut once. Right? You must count up the cost. If you're going to build a tower, who is going to build a tower and not count up the cost? First thing you got to do, how much does this thing cost? How much does this ministry going to cost us? That doesn't say don't do it. That just means you, your faith has to be in a position that we come together, unify, and that we can do all things through Christ that strengthens us, that unifies us. We can do it, but we have to come into this big word alert, agreement. Got to come, everybody has to come into that agreement. And a lot of times pastors have that, 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 that wrestling to try to help articulate and to get the body into an agreement, okay? So to ensure the financial integrity of God's house, we must do something that does not come natural. And that is to build a uh, trust in a financial system rather than, as I said, trusting people financial system. So here's a question I ask myself for you. Pastor, to ensure redundancy, things happen, but the gates of hell shall not prevail. Why, Pastor? The, 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 in the, the redundancy of your ministry, to make sure it's pushing, to make sure it's going to be at that next level as it grows naturally, you're going to have to have your financial systems in place. And let me just give you a piece of that. Go to the next slide, please. Um, um, accounts payables, accounts receivables, payroll, bank reconciliation, budget, general ledger, inventory, audit trail, accounting systems. How many of y'all have an accounting, an electronic accounting system in your ministry? Okay, accounting. There, are, there are several. There are several, um, and find someone who is versed in it. They're not expensive. Uh, you can get a QuickBooks Basic for thirty dollars. You can get a QuickBooks Plus for around sixty dollars. $90. But what this does, it comes with all, it helps you. So here's the thing about the, comp the technology systems. It forces us to become accountable. See, we talk and we think we are very articulate and people understand. But a computer will let you know how articulate you are or ineffective you are. Yeah, right. Or oh, how dumb you are. Right, right, right. Right. But when you begin to computerize the thing, just like accounts payable, it, how many of y'all need the, 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 the cash in the church's coffers as long as you can have it in there? You need the money in the bank, right? But how many of us pay vendors the moment they give us an invoice? Or do you do a, a net 20, a net 30, or whatever? In other words, uh, do the service now, and we'll pay you in 30 days, two weeks or something like that. When you, when you get this type of system, it, it has that in there where it can at least keep that on your mind, accounts payables, uh, where you can have uh, standardized vendors that sometimes annually in the year you can ask them for a sponsorship. You, you, you know, hey, we, you know, we've, been, we've been using you. You've been cutting our little grass. And, and so uh, we got this whatever. Amen. This is how you track that. This is how you try to get some kind of income back from that. And so here's the thing. In this season, we recommend that U.S. church leaders adopt their accounting system. Um, automate, as I said, your check processing. Um, automate your accounts receivable. This is the thing where uh, accounts receivable, where you keep track of your members tithing, giving, all of that. You, you keep up with them. Um, so good record keeping on this part is this. The advantageous piece of it is when you keep records like that, you can give a report quarterly. The more 
the, 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 the more efficient you are in reporting quarterly, hey, this is what your tithe is. This is what you're giving in donations, sowing, and da da da, pledges, whatever. Don't you know people will say, they will say one or two things praise God. Or they'll say, ooh, I got to catch up. I thought I gave more than that. Oh, and then they'll say this third thing I didn't know they were keeping track. Amen. Uh, um, the more efficient you are in this payroll, uh, how many of y'all have uh, musicians that you're paying? Amen. I mean, I got singers y'all paying. <laughs> Amen. They were getting there, right? Uh, right, right. We turned into Presbyterian Church. Uh, we used to just pay musicians. Now we we paying singers now. You got to pay singers now because of that that streaming right there. Uh, that's that's a whole nother level. Uh, we thank God for Bishop Porter and his vision. Um, when you see, you just, you, it's, it's an easy thing. You pull up your phone and you're streaming. You're like, yeah, yeah, that's great, great, great. But you need to understand the kind of expense that that requires. Yeah. Hey, man, you, you wouldn't believe what that camera costs. You wouldn't believe what this mic costs. You wouldn't believe uh, the other things, the, the know-how. The editing and all of that kind of stuff, the nice little graphics on it, and, and even the sound. Some of y'all, you, you're like, ooh, I'm going to stay at home tonight. I got my big screen on the wall, and it sounds good. You're like, hey, yes, but when it comes from an offering, don't move. Don't move. Don't go anywhere because just like you were in the house, amen, you got to understand that the house has come to you now. Isn't that something? That same, that, that, that power, that anointing. And so we have to even elevate in our minds to say, hey, I need to sow seed. As the church evolves, we are the church. We have to evolve. But the more we understand the cost of things, the more, uh, uh, that, uh, the more susceptible we are to, to, to sow into those things. Right? All right, almost finished here. Accounts payable, receivable, online giving. Online giving. And I think 20, um, around 2015, uh, online giving was uh, like 30% of a church's budget. 30% online giving. But after COVID, now online giving on the average is around 67%. And, and just think about this. During COVID, when some churches were closed, online giving was like 90%. Amen. I folk was sliding, sliding money under the door. Just drive by the church and slide it under the door. Amen. But the bulk of them was sewing online. Isn't that something? Him say, oh, what a blessing. Isn't that, isn't, isn't that thank you, Jesus? All the pastors need to shout, amen. Yes, Amen. Where would I be without Facebook? Would you believe you would have said that? Amen. That's, but but that's, that's, that's that evolution. That's that process and that progress. Uh, let's, let's go on down to um, some budget. I start off with the budget. Budget is a, is a best guess. A best guess. What your minister is going to do. Pastor, how do we do a budget? Take your last two years' expenses. Look back two years. Pull them out. Um, analyze them. And see what happened. Then take your vision for, for the next year and begin to work with that. This, this thing that, that the pastor I always said, budget should start with the pastor. Pastor, what are we to accomplish? Because the thing about it is what we put funds in last year, we might not put those same funds in for the next year because based upon our vision. Amen? And so the budget should reflect the mission statement of a church, business or organization. The budget should be based upon projected income as well as past performance. It should include a spending plan which uh, will be communicated to all. Luke 14, 28 and it talks about the tower. Uh, which of you intended to build a tower? Sit it not down first. Yeah, I know you want to start with the money first. 
Yeah, we're going to raise this money. We're going to raise this money. And how you go? No, you need to start with the expense. What it's going to cost you. Count up the cost. And here's the thing. Here's the faith principle of it. Oh, my God. No matter what the cost is, if you're doing this for the Father, if you're doing it for the work of the church, God will supply. Amen. He will supply. So don't be afraid of the cost. And I found out something about the cost. The cost is, is always relative. He will not put any more on you than you can bear. That's why you need to have uh, somebody leading you that the Bible speaks about that is not a novice. Amen. You, 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 you need somebody leading you that is not a novice. That, 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 that you know, if you've never been, because here's the thing. Put a person over 4,000 cedar church, 4,000, 12,000 member congregation, and they've been pastoring 25 people for the last 10 years, and they will not have success until they have gotten it down to where they came from. It, it just doesn't fit. That's why we have to be careful. Uh, lay hands on no person suddenly. Amen. You have to be prayerful about who you're putting over certain things. You don't just put anybody over your choir. If, if, the, if, the, if you think the music is important, you, want, you, you got auditions and everything else. But, but when it comes to the finance of the church, I'm talking about this is, this is what we're going to be dealing with to, to, to fund all of that to give the wisdom on how to uh, manage all of that, you need somebody that is not a novice. Yes, sir. Popularity don't make it uh, you not be a novice. Amen? I mean, that's just, you, you know. So here's the thing. Hear me say, measure twice, measure cut, twice. cut once. Thank God for our bishop, Bishop Brandon Porter, we thank God for him. Um, Bishop Porter has, he, he's my, my elder brother and my bishop. And all while we were working together, he, he taught me so much because he can't stand nobody that talk and don't do. Yeah, so here, hear me say strategy. And that's because that's, that's where his air is. That's the atmosphere that he lives in. So you have to understand that if you're around people that they're highly motivated, high achievers, your challenge is to grow. You, I mean, and fast. Amen. That's a challenge. It's not for you to say, why are they doing that? I don't understand what he's doing. Every time I see them, they're up there and they're down there and they're over there and they're over there. Why are they doing that? No. There's a lesson in that. Amen. God is trying to show you something. So the budget should reflect that mission statement. I said all those things, uh, but I want to get to, here it is. Go to finance, investing, savings, and charity. Almost finished. Ecclesiastes 11 and 1 says this. Ship your grain across the sea. After many days, you may receive a return. Him say R-O-I. Return on investment. What do you mean, Pastor? But I mean, um, I, the, the church is supposed to have savings. The church is supposed to be investing. The church is supposed to be charitable. All of that. All of that should be part of your budget. Uh -huh. Ship your grain across the sea. After many days, you may receive a return. Invest in seven ventures. And of course, in this, uh, Solomon is not just talking about money, but he, he's talking about the heart for it. He's talking about being charitable. He's talking about your fiduciary responsibility. Meaning, meaning that uh, when we talk about all of us uh, in, in, in our charitable acts, you have a responsibility not to manage, uh, or well, you have a responsibility to manage but not manipulate all right. your sources and your resources. Okay? So here's the thing. Don't be stingy. You, you got to watch stingy folk that's over your money. 
You want wise people over your money. Now, it's the difference between stingy now, because a stingy person will do for themselves and not do for you. But you want a person that is wise and, and fiduciarily cognizant that this that God has placed us over is to help the work of the church. Yes. Amen? Yes. To help the work of the church. Finance, insurance, make sure you got adequate insurance on your properties. When it comes to churches because of global warming and, and how the weather patterns are, it's becoming hard for churches to get insurance. Especially on, on the coastal areas. It's, it's, it's hard. Matter of fact, you, you know, they'll tell you, uh, we'll let you, we'll insure the, the, the fixtures and the furniture, but we won't insure the, the building. Well, if the building goes, what's happening to the, it, 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 you know what I'm saying. So you have to be aware. You have to be aware. Mortgages and loans, and I'll be finished. Um, when you're attempting to get a mortgage, a uh, loan, as I said earlier, uh, a lot of it is about your faith principle. It's about your favor as it relates to your financial institutions. Don't wait to, that's why I was saying we're tied together, but what would happen if you all together place your money in the same bank? Then when it's time, the, the, the leadership of the church has something to bargain with. You know, we, we, come, to, we come to the bank and like, well... Can us just get along? <laughs> you know, and here's the thing. You might have $100,000 in the bank, and they're going to say, listen, we need a financial statement. We need a profit and loss. We need the balance sheet, and, and we need all of the names of your members. We need their ages and all of that. They're gonna, but we got $100,000 in the bank. Yeah, well, how much do you want to... Tomorrow. Well, we just want to borrow. We want to do a little renovation. But the thing about it is, consider the financial institution. Because some banks are just so large, they can take that posture. They got regulators watching and all of that. You might want to think about going, if you got the Bank of Moscow, the Bank of Fair County, the Bank of whatever, Tri-State Bank, you might want to go to that bank. I know it's convenient, B of A and all of these larger banks, but build relationship with those banks. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I said a relationship, not a fellowship. That's right. You have to spend time. You, you know, hey, you know, invite the folk to your church. It, you don't need to be a foreigner coming in. Right. Okay? Because a lot of times they have latitude to do uh, a whole lot of things, and they do do. But it's based upon relationship. That's right. Are you saying that because they know you, they're more likely to do various things for you? Yes, yes sir. Uh, Bishop said, uh, am I saying it? because if they know you, they are more likely to do uh, and have to do certain things for you? Yes, it really is because... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it, it, it really is. I mean, uh, there are churches with, with three, four, five, eight hundred members and money in the bank having a hard time getting loans. So it's, it's about relationship. Listen, I want to thank you. My time is up. Uh, yes, sir, Bishop. Up, so you're still talking. <laughs> um, success happens at the speed of relationship. All right? And... Um, Superintendent Pepita, and those that are watching online, y'all need to like and share this because he's a professional. Uh, Bishop W.L. Porter, when, did you tell your story? When he came to Memphis, when uh, Superintendent Pepita, Andrew, and Shirley moved to Memphis, when Mel and I moved to Memphis, Bishop Porter put him in the accounting department of the Church of God in Christ. Yes, he 1991. 1991, see right. that? And then he went from there becoming the chief accountant 
to becoming the CFO Amen. of the Church of God in Christ. And many of the principles and practices we have in the finance office now happen through the genius of Superintendent Andrew Papina. So he knows what he's talking about. Yeah. You mentioned something, Superintendent Papina, you mentioned managing over manipulating. Can you expound on that a little bit? Managing over manipulating. It's, it's a spiritual connotation as it relates to um, not just um, I'm over this, but this is mine. Um, we have the, and a lot of times it's not intentional, but it's just instead of us building ministry, we, we will at sometimes be a walt uh, around this. And because remember, we are working for the ecclesia, the good of the ecclesia, the church. And so um, we, we have these, we, we are, a lot of times we'll deal in our own little turrets. We'll deal, and, and that's in ministry just in general. We, we have that thing that we really have to war against. This is God's house. This is God's church. Uh, I worked for the Church of God in Christ for 20 years, and then I went into private sector school systems and things of that nature. And then I just went, I began, God called me to pastor full time. And I had to end my mind because my whole thing was when I was growing up with Bishop Porter, we were growing up, I wanted to be rich. I wanted to be rich. Ask me why. Because I wanted to show people how to be rich. I wanted to, that, that was admirable, wasn't it? Had record companies, publishing companies, we were renting houses and all of this and just working from dust and dawn and all of that until I gave up. And I said, yes, Lord. Yes. And when I said, yes, Lord, God said this, now you can teach them how to be rich. I said, Lord Jesus. And so I'm, I'm full time now. Matter of fact, 100% of my time, I, my wife, we, we try to work it out, uh, getting our time in as well. But uh, it's, it's, it's not everybody's journey, but it's everybody's journey in the body of Christ to have the understanding that everything that we do, we're doing it on behalf of the Lord. That's where I want you to go to, because... When you say management, you're talking about stewardship. Yes, sir. And in stewardship, you're managing someone else's stuff. Right. That's the mindset and mentality we have to have. Right. This does not belong to me. Mm -hmm. This belongs to God, which is your point. Yeah. But when I hear the word manipulation, I think of strongholds. Mm -hmm. I think of someone who is trying to have selfish gain. Yeah. So, therefore, you leave management to now control yeah. or a controlling spirit. Yeah. And then you get into misappropriation, yeah, uh, misapplying, where you're taking things out of the context that they belong. People manipulate when they can't wait. Whoa. Okay. Whoa. And so because they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. <laughs> yeah. And so good things come to those that wait. You mentioned that. You also mentioned, I'm just doing a quick review. I came in a little late, but I always enjoy hearing you teach especially in this area because you know so much about it in finance, uh, and uh, the church needs this. You mentioned about having your, uh, uh, having, uh, I think you said uh, ROA, is that what you said? Uh, return on investment. Return on investment. ROI, I'm sorry. But then this is key because many times in church, we don't take those minimal risk with the money of the church. Yeah. But you should at least invest 10% of what you have. 10%. You know, yeah. um, I heard a statement once says that poor people, um, they spend what they have and invest the rest. Right. But rich people invest what they have and then they spend the rest. Right. Um, they live off the residual, like Rick Button over there, he got a lot of money, off of the investments that you made. Exactly. And, and so... The church, even in the church, we have to, and we've not done good about it in many instances, even in the jurisdiction, mm -hmm. is to put those monies, because in the bank, they're not paying you much. But you, you can get a low-risk portfolio, you know, mm -hmm. but you got to get more than 0.01% uh, 
there's some there's some um, systems where you can get as much as what now maybe four or five. Yeah, uh, and but you have to seek those out, and the banks aren't going to be eager to tell you. It seems it's sad, but it's it's what's going on, and our money sits there, and we get nothing for it, but we can make more. So we have to take some of those larger pools of monies we have, and large is relative. Right. Large to somebody right. could be ten thousand. Large to somebody else could be a hundred thousand. But you don't have a have, you don't have to have a lot to start investing something, so you get some returns. So you got to grow what you already have. When Jesus tells the parable about mm. the, the, the talents mm -hmm. and the whole idea of why he called them good and faithful servants is because they grew what they were given. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you don't grow what you're given, mm. then you're losing what you had. All right. Return on investment. The church, the church, a lot of times we don't get serious about... Uh, Growth, yes. property, unless we want to put something on it ourselves. But when you talk about streams of, of, of revenue, um, uh, God put in Genesis, he put Adam and Eve in the garden. And he had four streams coming in to replenish the garden. Amen. So when it comes to us, you have to look the 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 leaders, the visionaries of your ministry. You have to look look at what's around you. Quit looking over there, and look at where God has planted you, and what you need is right there. What what you're straining for? You like oh we're gonna do this in five and ten years? No, look at where you have been. Bishop uh, has a book. Uh, you know where you've been planted. Bloom where you've been planted. Bloom where you've been planted. You and you that that root will get big enough that you got to get another pot. Amen. So you are so anything it is you are supposed to grow church. Amen. And so don't. And when you, when 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 you have gone as far as you can go, in your intellect, your skill set, let me say power, Lord. Power. When you say power, Lord, you're asking for more help. You're asking for to bring somebody. There's somebody in your church. There's somebody you know. There's somebody that knows you that will help you. You just got to ask for it. Amen. It's in the house. Let me say build. Yeah. God's God. house. Any other questions? Comments? I do. Yes, ma'am. All the uh, NASDAQ and all those folks that are at the top, as far as investing, you suddenly, you hear, all of a sudden they drop. Mm -hmm. You know you're going to lose then. So what's a safe investment to think about? Is it you look, you say where you are, start where you are. What's where we are, except land around us. What, what would you suggest? At, at this point, land is a safe investment, I would think, according to where you are. But when you talk about Standard & Poor's and NASDAQ and, and uh, S&P, all those things, that, that <laughs> y'all didn't hear that. <laughs> That's a long game. That's a long game. That's a long game. So you want to put, you if you put in investing into uh, some stocks or some complicated stocks, you want to put it in. You want that. You don't want to put that in and try to get it out. Uh, it, well, when you see it go down, so, oh, my goodness, something's going down. I got to get you, you called in your person. No, 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 no. That's, yeah, yeah, just let it ride because on the average, on the average, you're gonna, it's gonna come back up. It's gonna catch up. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Most people that snatch out, they lose out. And so those are things. Uh, when it comes to fiduciary responsibility and organizations like a church, you you can't really play fast and loose with stuff like that. Uh, but you need to put it in something that's stable. That, that has some, some consistent gain in it because those leaders, when you talk about fiduciary responsible, you are responsible. Whoever you sign in those checks, you are responsible to that group. Yeah. 
incremental growth. You know, so you can so you can start small as far as you're investing. Anything else? Anybody? Yes. I have two questions. And the first one is, does the pastor be the bookkeeper at Clarence County? And the second question is, if you ask, what's your budget? And you don't get the answer, is it time for you to leave? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> ask, ask those questions again. So, with the microphone. Okay. The first question is, should the pastor be the bookkeeper slash accountant? <laughs> Second question is, if you say, what's our budget, and you don't get the answer, should you leave? Well, should the first question, should the pastor be the accountant slash bookkeeper? Well, can I be transparent? I am my church's accountant slash bookkeeper. Um, I have the experience to do that. You know, see, so when it comes to the, the, char the characteristics that we talked about, truthful, full of the Holy Ghost, wisdom, if your pastor meets that criteria, matter of fact, if your pastor meets the criteria of being your pastor, you know, that, that would, I would see it as an added extra unless you have others. You follow me? Growing to that. Because your pastor don't want to continue to be the accountant. Right. Yeah. So because sometimes, <laughs> sometimes <laughs> you repeat it, it's because of financial limitations. Right. You're not going to charge the church no. what an accountant would. Uh, sometimes the pastor's not only the accountant in the book, sometimes he's the painter, the janitor, the bus driver. Bus driver. <laughs> Now you tell me what the budget is. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Now, now, hold, hold on. Now she said the second question was if you ask for a budget and you don't get one, my 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 uh, need more information statement would be: Do you have a budgetary process? Do you have a budgetary process? Okay, so I wouldn't ask for a budget knowing that I didn't have a budgetary process. I would, as far as respectfully, come to the leader, like uh, Bishop Fisher said, and have an offline conversation, because there may be something you can help with. You follow me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, uh, 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 Pastor uh, uh, June Vimber, do we have a budget? Uh, well, you know, I'm trying to work on that. It takes people a long time to do stuff they don't know how to do. So when you, when you feel that hesitancy, maybe that's when God is telling you to come help. Or you might know somebody that can help, have that conversation. Yes, sir. I was also going to say, um, if, if the pastor of the church is Church of God in Christ, uh, the, the Constitution, uh, and I think Bishop Porter would back me up and say this, the Constitution declares the pastor is the ex officio of every budget of every board in the church, mm -hmm. which is means he is the he is the the, the, the chairman board, ex officio chairman, yeah. of the finance board, the trustee board, the usher board, the deacon board, and any other kind of board you have. And so, uh, although I am the ex officio of the of every board, uh, the finance committee, I don't I don't run the everyday operations of the budget of our finances. I have people in place for that, but also on the on the, on the flip side of that, I oversee it. They don't make decisions without me understanding why we will pass this, why we need to make this decision, and so forth and so on. That's number one. Then number two, if a person is asking for a budget, the first question I'm going to ask is, let me see your tithing and your giving. Because I don't believe, because I, I, I and Brother Sharp, she, she's a faithful member of our church, and she, they'll tell you, uh, our policy is, unless you are a financial uh, tithing and giving member of our church, you don't have the right to set up a, a meeting with the church or the finances to look into church finances if you're not giving. Because we don't trust, I don't trust that you're going to keep our information uh, in, in discretion and quiet and secret in the house. You, you'll take our information and go out if you're not investing in. So that's another thing that I do. I make sure that they are a member of the church, number one, in good standing. And if they, and if they are, yes, you have every right to look at any budgetary need that we have our church. That's how we do. 
Uh, 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 one of the things I just think that we need to also consider, and Bishop said it, is that a lot of times, you said it also, Superintendent, is that a lot of times when we're looking at churches, so many of us are looking at mega churches, bigger churches. Um, Church of God in Christ is mostly made up, the average membership of a Church of God in Christ church is under 100 members, 50 or under. And so what happens a lot of times is, so when you look at the, the culture of our church, you're, you're going to have smaller ministries, people that are trying to get things off the ground. And so that's why these classes are so necessary, because a lot of times, even in our training, in our culture, no disrespect, but we, uh, we learn the Bible, we learn the Holy Ghost, we learn how the flow of service, the worship, but we very rarely have these financial institutional classes, these budgetary classes. And so a lot of times as the church grows, if that has not happened, you get you get this exponential growth. And then, like you said, now you're trying to pull things back together because a lot of times, especially as, as me being the chairman, I over four states, I talk to so many pastors and leaders. This is their first leg. They're stepping out. And they don't even have an idea of mm -hmm. how all of these things work together. Right. And so what happens is you still got people coming in. You still got people that you're praying for, preaching, laying hands on. And a lot of times this stuff gets thrown in the back. So I think we have to also remember that sometimes when you're dealing with a smaller church that does not, as Bishop said, have that budget and then trying to find that person sometimes that's when you get into that gray area of trying to maximize and make that happen amen one, one thing as as i get ready to go to my seat what we have to remember is and as uh pastor cows hoon talked about as far as first legs people starting and all of that what i have found is the smaller the church, the larger the skill set of the pastor has to be. You want me to say that again? The sm the bishop touched on it. The smaller the church, the larger the skill set is the pastor has to have. The pastor has to know something about HVAC. The pastor has to know something about plumbing. Pastor has to know something about tax law. Amen. That's right. uh, the wow. pastor has to know something about banking. You, you know, you got churches that got the pastor's social security number on the bank account Amen. because they just didn't know. You, you, I mean, so the pastor is exposed. I mean, the pastor's family is exposed. And all of that. And nobody really ever have that conversation until it comes to a, a, a linchpin situation. And then we want to, well, why you do that? Well, why? Da, 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 da. Well, hey, you know, they the pastor. They just don't really want to say, I didn't know. Oh, man. I know Jesus. <laughs> but nobody, even though, even though the church is not a business per the IRS statute, it has and requires business acumen. You 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 got to know something about it, but if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. So to take that vision from the leader, strategically deal with it so everybody can see, write the vision up on tables, make it plain. That includes the finance piece. Make it plain that he who readeth can run. Tithers can run. Those that are going to give volunteers can run. Those that are going to give the community, check this out, the political people and the people in power in your city can run when they know you doing business. Amen? They're not just calling Bishop Porter because he's just saying, the Lord told me to come over here and all of that. The Lord may have told him that, but the Lord also gave him power. Gave him a skill set to know how to. The biggest thing we don't know how to do is how to ask. 
Yes, sir. That's the whole thing that I'd like to move to expound on. I know our time is over. But you mentioned, you mentioned that God gives you power. And you said that that power is a skill set. So if you could just kind of uh, elaborate on that a little bit, because I think that's very important. I want to know a little bit more about that. And, and, and he gave us power, Holy Ghost power. Power to what? Live. To do. Power to to witness. All that that is that that that's the overarching fundus of it. But there is a detailed piece of it. To just say that is one thing. Okay, he gives up power, but power of what? He the Holy Ghost leads us and guides us into all truth. He leads us into uh, what we don't know. He leads us there. He will lead us to help. A lot of times when the help comes, we run the help off because the help don't think like us. I was just here to help. Get away from me because you're not thinking like me. They were here to help. You think like that. You're feeling that void that God has uh, put in you. You feel it, but you need help on the other place. So when you're talking about that power, collab power to collaborate and 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 bring people together to get the work of the ministry done. Anybody else? Yes, sir. As a way to do everything, and if a person has some type of suspicion about the pastor as to why he's over everything, then as a way to do that, go to him and him alone, and you know let the pastor know you know your concern. Then it can be worked out better. Yes, sir. Because you have better understanding. Yes, sir. And the, and out of all of your getting, get an understanding. Get under there. Get under there. That that's what we're doing now. A lot we have fellowship, but we don't really take a lot of times, in my opinion, to be a relationship. Because the more you know your leader, the more you understand, the more the less needs to be said. So we have to we have to build those components. And and I, again, Bishop Fisher talked about it having business meetings. I don't have business meetings. I, you know, we just come together because it's just something about when you say you're going to have a business meeting, you see people that have never shown up before, <laughs> and, and you don't even know who they are. They, they come in with their fish balled up. This thing, yeah, something I've been, it's been in my crawl, and I, you know, I just need to get this off of my chest. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to say that God gives us power to walk in our giftings. Yeah. And we are many members, and it takes all of our gifts working together mm -hmm. to perform what he would have us do. Yes, ma'am. Well said. Anybody else? Y'all got it all masked clear? Y'all ready to go? Y'all ready to do it? Hear me say, make ministry work. Come on, thank you. Come on, let's give a, a round of applause for Superintendent Andrew Pepiner. That's P E R P E N E R. Andrew Pepiner, gifted, thankful for his gift to the body of Christ, and always uh, enamored to hear him talk, especially in this area of his strength and proven intelligence. Uh, he worked at Lane College. What the area did you work in at Lane College? accounting and financial aid and so well-rounded in uh, his studies and knowing this and I really really enjoyed that that was a powerful point though yeah. that a pastor who passes a small church has to have a well-rounded skill set yeah. to know how to do most all of it and I so I thank God for my uh, early upbringing you know I know I started out as a janitor at the church in Memphis and all but I wasn't a pastor. I was a pastor's son. But when he sent me to Jackson, <clears throat> right here in Jackson, Tennessee, <clears throat> at uh, 18 years old, running up and down the road while I was in college, I had to learn uh, how to do hands-on stuff, you know. I had to learn how to hang lights. I know how to hang. I know how to put lights in the ceiling. 
I hear you looking at me, Elder, Elder, Elder Calhoun. You know, he's a licensed electrician. I ain't had no electric, elect, what do you call it? Electrician license. I had driver's license. I can go to Home Depot and get what I need and come back and put that in there. And, um, uh, you know, you got to know a little something of everything. And I'd have to play the organ for myself. I know, I, I, in, in, yeah, in C or A flat. And, um, then, uh, so, it's on-the-job training. And so that's what makes me, it really made me the well-rounded person, Pastor Dixon, I am now, to knowing all of those things about the organ and when things go wrong, how you got to fix them, everything. Uh, because you couldn't always afford to bring somebody in. And you had to do it uh, yourself. Uh, and so I'm thankful for that experience, and it gives me a great appreciation of the totality of ministry and serving. That's why uh, people always go, you just want to sit down. I ain't never sat down. As long as a bitch W. L. Porter, your dad, you had to, you had to be moving. You know, matter of fact, for we were, we were, he was pastoring. I pastored one church, three locations. He pastored uh, three lo different cities at the same time, and one was four hours away. So we'd have to get up. You talking about Clarksville, Mister? Let me tell you something. I know about that, Mister. You know, because from Memphis, every Sunday, we had to drive to Clarksville and be there in time for Sunday school. That's right. And then um, then we leave Clarksville and come to Jackson for the for the live radio program Sunday night. And then go on home and try to do your homework in the car and everything else. And uh, so on the road. So when I get in the car, I go to sleep because I feel like I'm at home. Because that's where I spend most of my time. He ain't want to stop for nothing, you know. And we was like, Dad, can you stop? I ain't stopping. They could use a pop bottle and whatever, you know. Boy, <laughs> we, I remember, you know, you'd be surprised how much you can remember <clears throat> from way back. I remember being small enough to sleep on one side of the floorboard in the back seat of the car on the floor. <clears throat> I remember that. And so, uh, but go back to some of the things Pastor Pepino was mentioning um, as um, – the pastor makes sacrifices, and, and Sweetheart said about the budget, and that is, a, that is a valid question. But usually when someone asks about a budget, they're going to bring solutions. Right. You know, if you, usually if I ask someone what's your budget, it's because I'm trying to give you a price or help you uh, uh, facilitate whatever it is you're trying to accomplish, you know. Um, when someone's talking to me about a work, what I say, what's your budget, so we can talk money and get to a solution. Uh, not just so I can get in your business, but so I can do business with you. And and that's the in, intent, hopefully, of that. And even in our churches, to know what's what what's operating, how can you add to it? You know, how can you build in it, right? What kind of sacrifice are you willing to make? Because a budget is no more than a good guess anyways. And many times people don't know, my house, my house is worth over a million dollars, probably a million point two or three. But guess what? If you look up my home address, you know what it says? Greater Community Temple. Oh, it sure do. Why? Because I put my house up as a as a, uh, um, a collateral for the church, so we could get five million dollar loan to build a new church because we didn't have enough collateral. And so, if something happened to me, and the wrong fella get in that church, they're gonna be trying to take that house from my wife. So I, now I gotta pay it off and get a quick claim so Miller can keep the house. But that's a sacrifice that a pastor makes. How many of y'all put your house up for the church? You know what I'm saying? I'm talking about how many of y'all would do it, and you ain't the pastor. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so usually churches are giving pastors house allowances. You understand? But my house, I put the whole house up in the name. I don't, I'm not reaping the bill. I'm still paying for it. Not the church. I'm paying for it. Okay? But still, I did that. For the, the comfortability of being able to give the church an opportunity to invest. Now we're almost to the point where I'm, we're looking forward to, to having a mortgage burning so I can get my house back. <laughs> Amen. I may want to go borrow some money against my house now. Right? <laughs> and, so, and, and so many times people don't understand the sacrifices uh, that we make uh, in the church. And the preacher and the bishop and the pastor have to be the first partaker. My church is a tithe, the tithe paying church. Our tithe, the tithe, what we do every month, our church pays probably more than half of what comes in 
in the tithe of tithe because we have to be the first partakers. And so if you're going to ask where something is, make sure you can tell us where yours is too and where your investment is in it. Amen. What your sacrifice is in it as we push further along. Uh, many churches, and I kind of know the constitution of where you are because the church of God in Christ, we move differently from the Baptist church. We, like others, we're not the only ones. We're not a cult, uh, but this is a common practice. It's called Episcopal, where the authority comes down from the bishop down. And um, in a congregational church, it is the authority comes up from the congregation up. So it's, it's uh, being controlled by the membership more so than by the, uh, pre- the Episcopal or the Presbytery. So... Um, and understanding that, like even with trustee boards, you got to have checks and balances. So I'm not, don't get me wrong. You know, so trustee boards and governing boards are still good to have. But a friend of mine, he's gone on now. Bishop Carlton Pearson said, "The only thing worse than a demon possessed church is a deacon possessed church." <laughs> but <laughs> with somebody just trying to control something and not invest anything in it. But sometimes, though, you got to have these because when you get guys coming in who didn't start at that church, but they were brought into the church, and the people that have been there, they paid for it and built it and everything else, they should have something to say, you know? Even in the Church of God in Christ, sometimes you don't know the authority you have as a member in the Church of God in Christ. Um, no pastor can come and take your church and move it away from Kojic without your saying. That church belongs to the members of the church of God in Christ in that church. You understand? The trustee holds the church in trust for the members of the church. That's why even when it comes to jurisdictions, how we change from one jurisdiction to another, two thirds of the church has to say, we want to move from Tennessee central to some other lesser jurisdiction. Cause you know, we the great, we the greatest, right? <laughs> so two thirds of the congregation have to agree to that. All right. Uh, but only only 51% of the congregation has to rise and say, we're sick of this pastor. Two-thirds to take to move to another jurisdiction, but less than that to move this pastor. Now, all they can do is file charges, and Calhoun runs that department. They file charges, but it takes 51% of them to file charges because some pastors get out of order. They're human beings. How many of y'all know pastors can backslide? They can slide back, up front, sideways, all kind of ways. People, my dad told me men have clay feet. And guess what I found out? You women do too. Amen, somebody. So, uh, so all of us are subject to challenge. That's why you got to have checks and balances in place. And you got to have you know, people in place to get things done. Someone else said something a moment ago about it's in the house. I had to pray because we needed some help in the area of finance in our church. And didn't know, right in your church, God accommodates you. You don't even know the wealth of knowledge of people right in your congregation until you make mention. And I put out a robocall saying we needed somebody for a particular area in finance. And a young lady hit me back and said, Bishop, that's what I do for the Hilton every day. I would love to help the church. I'm like, good grief. And, man, she came in like a tornado. I'm like, good. And then asked for a dime. And, and everything we were wanting, she already knew and had it and knew what to do with it. But you'd be surprised. When you, when we came to Jackson, we didn't have a musician. I prayed to ask God for a musician. The Lord sent us Andrew Pepina. He was our minister of music here. And he was Baptist, you know, so we had to teach him. We had to teach him shouting music. We had to teach him shouting music. Had to teach him, yes, Lord. He was praying. What was the church you were playing with, Macedonia? He was playing for Macedonia. So we adjusted our service time for him to get out of his service. You know what I'm saying? So he come over play. Because I was bringing up Timothy Wright and, and Jane Moore and, and Twinkie and everybody. I said, uh, Dennis Hutch. I said, Lord, give us a musician in Jackson. And Pip pop up Andrew Pepina, right? And then he brought, he brought the pretty girl along with him, Shirley, so she could sing in the choir with us, too, and all. Amen. Wow. She was a choir director. That's right. Wow. Hey, she used to work at McDonald's when I first came up in the supervisor. I would come through the drive through and she'd be right there doing the May I help you? I said, give me some fries, girl, and move on. Don't, don't write it down. <laughs> but, <laughs> ain't the Lord all right? God is good. God bless you all. 
Thank you for logging on with us. Hey, like and share this. Uh, I know we can't campaign now because we got to wait till after the general, the general assembly meeting in April. But there's some people running for certain positions. I ain't talking. This ain't campaign. We talking about y'all just have to be listening. Uh, but I'm talking Tennessee Central right now. You know, we got people in our jurisdiction that are seeking positions on trustee board, finance secretary, general board, and other stuff, you know. So we'll tell you more about that later. You'll be hearing more. Maybe in our convocation we can have more of a robust presentation. I know Sister Westman was supposed to do something on Friday. She had to go back out the restaurant. She also uh, applied for this guy. I'm done talking to you.